There we go. Okay. I'm not going to do the blurb again, so we'll just go to the slideshow. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to share that. I'll get it up. And uh, there we go. So hopefully you can all see that nice and clearly. Yep. And hopefully this is going to, oh, what's it doing? Why isn't, oh, there we go. Uh, so these are the participating artists. There's 31 of us in the end, uh, which was fantastic. And it's such a diversity of work, which is brilliant. So we will start with An Angela Rosito. Uh, I'm not sure if Angela here, would you like to talk yes. about your work? Oh. Hi, hi, I'm here. Great. <laughs> um, so um, I generally do uh, large scale installation work. So the works that I've put into this show are a little bit different for me. Um, since 2017, I've been making smaller scale works as well as really large works. And the four that you can see on screen are, are sort of inspired by um, uh, embroidery, but they're not sort of technical embroidery and, and, and beading. And um, they've got really miniature crochet. And uh, I guess the thing that I've, they, these works relate to my recent PhD um, work, which was based on deep time. So I'm trying to, um, I guess, convey or evoke um, things that might be out there in the universe, beautiful little delicate little things. Um, I like the play of micro and macro, the things that I've made, they look micro, but maybe they relate to something macro. Um, yeah, they're, they're a bit fanciful as in nothing is reference from anything. That's enough talking about that one. Okay. <laughs> uh, and this book here, um, uh, look, I've, I've remade it since I made it that time that you can see there. It's called Over and Over Again, um, because my, partly because my work is really repetitive. I do lots of different um, techniques like crochet and knitting and there's uh, cobra weave and sometimes I do spiral yeah. weave, four piece and five piece plaiting. And um, what I was trying to do when I made this was I was trying to make a, a standalone sculptural thing. I usually do installation. I was trying to make a standalone sculptural piece that was a little bit like Francois, Francois Grossen, who's a really, maybe you've heard of her famous Swiss artist in the 60s. She made these really cool sculptures that look like creatures and they're um, made from um, large scale natural rope. Mine is colorful, but um, okay. yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Great. That's probably enough. Uh -huh. um, Anna, Anna Taylor. Is she here? I've got someone coming in. Okay, so Anna has Deception, which is a large piece. And then my keyboard stopped working. Um, and this one's Crustacean. And we have a beaded geranium root and a pod. Mm, beautiful. Um, Annette Fitton. Excuse me if I say Hi, Hi, Annette, would you like to talk about Mel's Mob? Okay, Mel's Mob is a, a group of seven kangaroos based on the Eastern Grey kangaroo. In 2019, uh, a group called Yarn Bombing Trevento uh, started off by inviting as many yarn bombers around the world that they knew of, off Instagram, to um, exhibition that was going to be in, in their little town of Trevento. I think they were really trying to promote their little village. And I was one of the people that received an invitation and I thought, well, that's too good to pass up. What can I do to bring something different from Australia rather than a, you know, a bunch of flowers or something like that? It's got to be Australian. So I thought, I know, I'll bring a kangaroo. And then I thought, you can't just bring one kangaroo. You've got to have a whole mob. It'd be lonely, wouldn't it, if there's just one? And then I thought, how on earth do I get a whole mob of kangaroos into my suitcase to take them to Italy? <laughs> It was the best, it was the best challenge. Yeah. And uh, I figured out how to do it. Started off by making the kangaroos and then covering them with uh, some fabric and then um, doing, uh, you know, making the fabric removable. So the bigger ones have all got zips underneath so you can take the skin in inverted commas off the sculpture. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. I love knitting. I've been knitting since I was four and I just love it. And about four, four or five years ago, I learned how to knit lace because I've been yarn bombing for a while and I thought I've got to stir up this mob and make them you know, look at knitting in other ways, not just crocheted granny squares and, 
and strips of garter stitch, but there's got to be other ways that you can make people look and go, wow, and knitting lace has been such a fantastic adventure. Most of these guys are covered in Shetland lace, although Frost Flowers, the one that Mel, the big gray at the top there he's wearing, is it something that came from Russia a long time ago. I found it on the Antique Pattern Library. So, so there you go, they're all covered in pure wool that's being picked up or recycled. Cycle from one way or another. Some of it was old cardigans that had been knitted all except for the sleeve or something. I've unpicked and knitted it. Is that enough talking? Probably is. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so um, I know Asher and Jacob couldn't make it. They're actually got on a presentation for a grant at the moment. So good luck to them. Uh, so this is their piece re recondition, which is pretty amazing. Um, CJ Stark, are you here? Yes, I am here. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, that is my name. My name is S P A R C. I'm not sure if I misspelled it, but um. Anyway, um. Uh, so my work, Jean Claude Pardon Cette Economie. I am a French major and a gender studies major. Um, I'm in my I'm in my third year of university. So like, this artwork for me was very much a combination of the two majors in my degree and a lot of the information how I understand the world. Um. Um, as a trailer to gender non, non this economy, to me, this kind of means kind of a de gendering of the body that we kind of see, um, and picking my own body as, an, as a non-binary person and to, G, to de gender that, even using an art that has been um, cast and historicized as feminine for a very long time, especially in like white Western, in a white Western context. Um, so it's about this artwork is very much me kind of just trying to challenge us all to deconstruct what we view as feminine and masculine and um, gender itself as being like a social construct that we perceive and to kind of deconstruct our perceptions. Yeah, that's oh, kind lovely. of how the work. Thank you. Demelza, I did see Demelza come in, how to use a washer. Um, Demelza, did you want to speak to yours? Sure. Um, yeah, so I have um, two drawings in the show. Um, Basically, I've been using needle and thread like a drawing tool. So um, I have pretty limited embroidery stitches. Um, I'm working from photographs and I choose moments that um, just capture something for me of um, my loved ones and um, some sort of moment that I that I basically want to spend a lot of time with. So I feel like in that whole process of drawing, um, you're spending a lot of time with the image and almost with the, the person that you're creating the portrait of. Um, so I enjoy using um, vintage linens that often have, you know, signs of wear. They might have holes or stains. And in this case, um, well, in the other one, this one that you can see now is a, a kimono lining. So it was actually, I think it only had a few stains, but I love the weight of it and the fact that it's had another life and that I'm extending that life in some way and um, often the cloth speaks to me because it might already be in a certain format so this one's like a bit like a banner um, this is my sister Emma who's here listening in hello Emma and um, my daughter's Teddy so yeah there's nostalgia in the image for me and um, yeah it was a really joyful process to spend time with her and make this portrait. Beautiful. Thank you. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. So, oops, I think I just skipped one. Hang on. Oh, hang on. No, what have I done? Oh, my, um, okay. There we go. Sorry, Di Ellis. Di, are you here with us? Hello, I am here. Oh, yes, there we are. Uh, <clears throat> Di. Well, I've done a whole series on old damask um, napkins of, Banksias and the try and the similar things that um, I found on COVID walks, and um, I've had a lot of death in my family this year, and I was interested in exploring shadow. And the shadow is sort of about the death, and that people are still with us even though they're gone. I've got a couple of other examples of them. Uh, that one was my mother's favourite vase. And then I've got two, can you see that one? And there's another one with a different sort of Diana Ware vase. I've gone back. And another little Grevillea I caught, found. 
And that's in another piece of Diana Ware. So I got a degree in printmaking, but discovered I was a stitcher and I've been stitching ever since. I usually stitch on organza and then cut it out and collage it. But over this COVID break, I've been working on damask, which has been really nice. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Evangeline. Hi, everyone. Um, you can hear me fine, I'm guessing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go for it. I've been painting for many years now. And then uh, last year, mid last year, I, I, I finished you know, making thousands of masks for a project, you know, giving them away and um, had all this stitching energy left over. So I, I um, just took up embroidery. Um, I've been sewing for many years that had never actually made like art out of it, just um, clothes for myself. And like instinctively, I just kind of stained a canvas, painted a canvas, and then have been embroidering the painted canvases and enjoying how like just the pouring of the paint creates these kind of imaginary landscapes. Like it, by the time I finish embroidery, I'm not thinking about what it is that I'm embroidering. I'm not thinking about what it's going to be, but at the end of it, they, they're ending up looking like landscapes yeah. um so this one's called fully a dua which is it's a term taken from new religious movements when like there's two there's a two people who who have certain beliefs and they meet and like individually maybe nothing would happen like they wouldn't start a new religious movement or <laughs> do what it is they're going to do and then to, they kind of like fuel each other's insanity or um, uh, motivation for doing whatever they're gonna do. And it just kind of like blows up from there. And I was thinking of these two mediums, painting and embroidery as the filia de ring. Like what kind of chaos are they gonna create together? Or is it gonna be beautiful? Um, and looking forward to what they get up to. That's me, thanks. Beautiful, thank you. Um, Heather. No. <laughs> hey. Is that me? Uh, yeah, Heather, would you like to speak to your piece? Um, yes, look, I'm, an old, I'm just an old crafter who plays around with recycled materials, really. And I discovered videotape, which is very interesting and difficult to work and probably toxic. Um, and sadly, my supply, which I thought would be endless, is running out. So. Um, recently, I, I've been making, as you can see, um, roses out of dead masks. So I just like oh. playing around, really. Oh, lovely. Oh, that's what they are. Thank you. Yep. And Phil. Um, uh, Janet, I did see you come in. Did you want to speak to your pieces? So, yes, yeah, so I um, have done all sorts of things, but I was given a beautiful container of, of um, doilies and sat on them for two or three years not knowing what to do with them and maybe giving them away to somebody and then I decided that it was me that needed to do something with them and so I've been mounting them on stretch canvas and stitching into them and adding some words or some pictures or I mean some patches if they're damaged and um, I think it might be a lifelong obsession because people keep giving me more <laughs> out of their linen cupboards or whatever and there's so many different things that you could do playing with them yeah. so it's been great fun and it was Sybil's collection and she's been gone for some time and her daughter gave them to me so they called the some of them are Sybil's because I just they were hers but people give them to me and they know who'd made them quite often so they can carry mm -hmm. on with the name so it's really just appreciating what people have done in the past and getting people to have another look at them so that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gem. I did see you here. You want to talk Hi. To oh, there you are. Right. Oh, we've got a little head there. Yes. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. So I'm Gem. I'm a textile artist based here in Ballarat. Um, this is a piece that I created 
school about 18 months ago, I think now. So um, originally this was due for exhibition um, as part of a City of Ballarat exhibition in April last year, which got cancelled because of our good mate COVID. Um, and yeah, this is um, the smaller piece. So what I, I've actually done a larger piece of this uh, of this work, but this was my um, initial piece that that I created. So it's um, embroidered in indigo dyed uh, cotton thread, as well as um, there's some letters throughout the piece. Um, that I've embroidered in copper coloured thread. And so um, this is, these are the words of a lady by the name of Catherine McClister, who um, lived here in Ballarat um, uh, just before the Eureka Uprising. Um, I came across her story um, when I was doing some research for, for this um, piece um, and it just resonated so so much um, so this what the words here are is um, it's a copy of her statement that she lodged to the local police authorities here in Ballarat at that time um, she um, she was subject to some pretty awful um, sexual harassment um, by her husband's boss who was the police commissioner um, in the town at the time. Um, unfortunately, yeah, she, uh, her case was dismissed <laughs> um, and she ended up uh, relocating with her husband to Geelong where she passed away, I think about a year or two later while she was in childbirth with her first child. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know, her story really resonated and I just, this was in part, um, an opportunity to, to really recognise her and her story, um, as well as a bit of therapy, I think, for myself, just given how much of, of some of what she was talking about resonated. So, yeah. Oh, lovely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so if I can get the next one up. Here we go, Julia. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. I just noticed how blurry that photo is. Sorry about that. I'm terrible at taking photos of my work. Um, anyway, um, hi, um, I have um, two pieces. You'll notice this one's called Anchored One. The other one is Anchored Two. So I can just sort of both speak to them both. They're it, sort of the same. Um, they're just sort of me sort of, um, Oops, sort of exploring sorry. like um, <laughs> sort of, um, texture and sort of shapes stitches like I can manipulate them into sort of um yeah it was basically just me working out that I suck at sort of creating really little detailed I don't know sort of like floral sort of things that I wanted to make and me realizing that this sort of random free form sort of playing with textures is just what I really connect with um and then also in right trying to write the artist statement for um entering this exhibition I worked out I'd made them both in lockdown last year and I noticed they're both sort of creating these shapes of sort of like something enclosed sort of something enclosed inside something else um and looking at them both after I sort of realized wow yeah. that sort of really reflects sort of that lockdown mindset it sort of made it glaringly obvious so I thought that was um kind of funny so then I sort of um ended up making them sister pieces and then anchored is sort of from just the way that you sort of embroider it's like you're anchoring stitches in thread and they sort of so repetitive you're like anchoring yourself sort of in the piece while you're working it's like therapeutic so yeah that's me thank you that's lovely uh, let's see if we can go Juliet yep hi there hi everybody um, I'm Juliet. Um, I am a textile artist based in Melbourne and I create expressive embroidered thread drawings uh, using freehand machine embroidery, um, which I like to think of as drawing with my sewing machine. Um, I've been exhibiting in and around Melbourne since about 2007. I'm not from Melbourne, as you might hear, and I just <laughs> wanted to 
Lovely. Um, hi, Mum, who's joined us this morning from or this afternoon from Scotland this morning for her. Um, so she's in Glasgow and she's here with us today, which is really exciting for me because she doesn't often get to come to openings of mine. Um, so my background is in fine art and I studied uh, sculpture originally and I discovered thread drawing um, quite a while ago now um, when I started to meet with a group of uh, like mighty creative women and um, quite a few of them were sores and they um, somebody introduced me to the whole concept of hand machine embroidery and um, I started to um, uh, basically turn my life drawings, so I've always been a life drawer, um, into uh, thread drawn pieces and um, yeah it was sort of love at first stitch and um, I've been doing that ever since really. So um, I my work sort of evolved in different directions since then but I still um, use my life drawings a lot as you can see from the two pieces here. Um, so in all my work, I'm aiming to express really how I relate to the world around me, my own experiences and particularly important to me are themes that relate to women. I'm aiming to portray a woman's sense of herself and her connection to the world. Um, I just love the thread online. Um, I find it to be, you know, really uniquely expressive. It's really unforgiving. It's very pure and honest. And that's really important to me in my work. Um, so both the works I have here are part of a larger body of work that's still in progress. Um, both of them have been made using Pihan machine embroidery and um, worked for my, developed for my own original life drawings. Um, and I've both, in both of them I've made use of um, soluble fabric, which I find to be a really exciting medium and a way of working. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, it's exciting because um, I love the potential of being able to take my drawings off the page or the, the substrate um, and create these sort of standalone um, lace um, drawings. So um, the first one I think is, uh, yeah, we're looking at uh, yep, yeah, no, 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 no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, it, I don't know why it, it, that, <laughs> that my one, arrows that's... aren't working properly. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. So this one, emerging reclining, was uh, one of the first ones I made um, in this style using. So it's basically uh, translated directly from a life drawing um, uh, into uh, thread using soluble fabric. Um, there's calico in there as well. Um, and she's actually and will be exhibited in a perspex frame, just sort of hanging in the frame. Um, the other one, um, emerging tumbling. Um, yep, yeah, that one. So um, this is created using, again, freehand machine embroidery and thread um, and using the solu soluble fabric. Um, but this one is also uses mulberry paper, which is um, a really uh, fantastic material. It's very, this fabulously fibrous, you know, lacy um, paper, uh, which is great to stitch on. Um, and um, yeah, here I've portrayed the figure as she's tumbling off the paper and I've added the, the fabric um, to depict uh, the mask, which was um, just my way of providing a sort of COVID pandemic context to the piece. Um, she was made last year in response to my own sort of experiences and um, really an exploration of that sort of transition that I felt myself going through, um, that sort of sense of change and loss of control and, um, you know, shedding of kind of habits and routines and kind of questioning, you know, what was less, what was left and, you know, the idea that sometimes, uh, you know, less is more. Um, yeah, so that's um, all I have to say about those. Thank you for the option Thank to. You. Thanks. That's lovely. Thank you. And Kathy. Hello. I'm coming to you from Castlemaine in central Victoria, which is Jajawaran country. Um, and I want to, I do want to take the opportunity to just thank all of the teachers, small businesses, community organisations who kept us going during our long lockdowns um, by 
pivoting to digital, you know. And um, in particular, I want to thank Angharad Rickson, who taught me how to knit and weave wire in January 2020, just in time. Yeah. Um, in person but then she transitioned to digital and has kept the community going and the other the other people I just want to express deep gratitude to are Erica Gofton and Alona Nelson who run the art room in Footscray which is the heart of my art community. Okay. The conversations that um, I have with all of these people are so important to my work. Um, the other, as a, someone who's painted and drawn um, a lot, but um, moved to stitching, um, one of the things that um, I also, I like what I, my work has, has been an expression of finding that my hands know more than my mind often. And the dialogue between the, my hands and the material uh, intuitively lead me into the ideas that I want to express. Um, and stitching has become a kind of ontological repair in that slowly, stitch by stitch, um, I connect the parts, the memories, the ideas um, into a story and an inner conversation. So the Athena that you're looking at now is is 180 centimetres um, high and about 70 wide. So it's more than life size. And as I was making this piece, my first big wire knitted piece um, last year in lockdown, um, I was thinking about being a second wave feminist and having got legal equality and all sorts of other equality, but still struggling. Um, and the need to have a sort of protective presence at my shoulder. So it became Athena, um, the goddess, who also, apart from being a goddess of wisdom and defensive strategy, is the goddess of weaving. Um, so it seemed to fit. Um, and because I'm interested in social change and I'm a woman and many of my ideas are feminist, um, and the next um, piece, which is actually a collection of smaller pieces, um, sort of expresses this. Um, the stories that come to me are often feminist. So I was thinking about women's troubles and um, the sort of bodily things that go wrong with uteruses and ovaries and fallopian tubes and various, you know, issues that we don't talk about very easily, even now, even now. Um, and uh, I thought about fallopian tubes and I thought, why are they spelt with a capital F? I bet that's named after a man. And I looked it up and indeed it, it, they are named after a man. But there's an alternative word for them, which is salpinx, which is the Greek word for a tube with a flared trumpet-like end. And it so happened that I was making all of these forms with knitted wire, which were tubes with flared ends. Um, and so I just kept going. And so this is the Salpinx collection, which expresses in my way, various reimagined um, women's troubles. Um, so I guess the ideas of feminists, but actually the most fundamental thing is the stitching and that connection with the heritage of, um, of stitching and the, the kind of way I have to trust in my hands and that dialogue with the material, which always has the last word. Um, and, you know, that's why I'm very happy to find myself in this textile art community and conversation. Thank you. Thank you, it's lovely. Uh, Lauren, oops, I've got ended up with one of your, oh, you know, I don't know what's happened there. Sorry, I've got one of your pieces, Kathy, on Lauren's name. Sorry, Lauren. Oh, sorry, Lauren. <laughs> Um, is Lauren here? No. So I'm going to, so there's two pieces from Lauren. And then we've got Leslie. Oh. Is her bear? No. Okay, so Lucy, are you around? I am. 
Oh, there we go. Lucy, hi. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I've managed um, a couple of people on my screen now. <laughs> <laughs> hi, um, I'm coming to you from the, the lands of the first peoples of the Millilamalli. I live at Redcliffs, which is near by Mildura, and we're currently in lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, the, the work that is up on, um, in, on the screen um, is a work called Tracing Threads, and it's been uh, co-created, or elements of it have been co-created with my mother, Anna. Um, and um, working in my, my, my arts practice, I combine live performance and make um, artifacts um, during those live performances where I transform myself um, into a version of my um, of my grandmother's my uh, my my um, heritage is Italian uh, specifically Calabria which is down the south down the, the bottom of the boot um, so I transform myself into a version of my grandmother's and um, uh, create in a, in a live art performance and enactment um, with an audience usually although at the moment we can't do that um, as a homage to them because uh, quite often the um, the wives of immigrants were um, working in the home or working in the fields and they and they didn't um, acknowledge you know that they didn't put themselves forward um, in a way that, that they would get acknowledgement. So the works that I create in my performances acknowledge them and um, you know, put, put, them, put them forward in, um, in a spotlight, I suppose, under the spotlight. So the work that I've um, created in this, this work, as I mentioned, has been co-created with my, with my mum, um, crochet uh, mainly, um, and um, some found... Um, Chain, so chains of red embroidery thread, again, that, um, a collaborative um, series of performances that I have been working on called Collective Crochet. Um, what, that's been um, performed in Mildura, Melbourne, uh, Rome um, and other places. So creating the, like a dual dialogue and um, the chain migration scheme that was um, operational in, in the 50s through to the 60s, 70s. Um, that many migrants, immigrants um, participated in, you know, call, um, heard the call to, to come to Australia. Um, in this work, there's also some objects, some, um, I call them spiritual amulets or religious symbols and icons that um, I have inherited from my mum, my father. Some, some of them have been sent to me from other people overseas. Um, there's also the inclusion of my own hair. So I started working with my own hair as a thread. Um, and I think of that as like a primal thread because um, the, the use of, of woven hair and, and hair in um, creation of objects is, goes back um, quite a few centuries even. Um, so all of this combined together and the, particularly this work that's been co-created with my mum is like a, a what I like to think of as a like a polyphonic dialogue that we have so we're continuing the the line um, I use red thread because it's um, reminiscent or evocative of, of blood or the bloodline veins um, and also um, the lifeline in general um, that's all well lovely thank you thank you very much so we'll go Lynn and Margaret. Are either of you or both of you here? I'm here. Margie, you're here too. I know you are. Yes, I'm here. So this is the collaborative piece. Margie and I are sisters-in-law from a long time ago. She and my brother divorced at some stage and I got her in the divorce settlement. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been working together on collaborating for, what, about 20 years or so? And give or take and we've made you know we've done various installation pieces um, both large and small this is I would call this one of the smaller ones at two meters by 600 millimeters um, and it's our reflection Margie you can jump in at any time you like it's our reflection on 
basically we started this or at least we started to pull it together around the time of the bushfires in Australia and it's called recovery for obvious reasons um, but we saw it as a reflection of um, the impact of the many challenges that we all face all the time in our lives um, and the subsequent journey back to some level of normality. That's a simplification of it for ourselves personally, but also as a collective. So you see the blooms coming out of the ashes basically there. So um, this was about a 12 month, maybe two, 18 month piece, Mark? I think it probably was. Um, we started it before the bushfires, but um, it, and I think as we were working on it, the bushfires are happening. And as we saw that we were incorporating that mustard pop of new growth out of those polyps, yeah. um, it, it really meant that we would then looking at the recovery of the forests after the bushfires. But like you say, also the recovery of um, our own selves after traumatic events. And, and that kind of continued on into the COVID time, it did make it difficult with COVID to do the work collaboratively. And I will acknowledge that you did the majority of the work given that the piece was sitting at your place and we lived more kilometres away and we weren't allowed to visit each other's homes anyway. So, um, but it was a great piece to work on and I love the final result. Mm, it's amazing. Oh, it was fun to do. Fantastic. Thank you. Mary. Is Mary here? Yes, I'm here. Here we go. <laughs> um, firstly, I'd really like to thank you, Tamara and Anna, for the, you must have just done so much work putting this together and it sort of feels seamless, but I'm, I just have a sense of an enormous amount of work. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so this piece is called Everyday Virus, and this is just a little bit of it. Um, at the beginning of April last year, um, in our first lockdown, I'm a hand weaver and I decided I'd just do some little weaving thing every day for 40 days as some sort of um, almost like a diary thing for myself about the lockdown and about how the virus was travelling. Um, and then in May, I got um, diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer. So I did a bit of the weaving around that. And then I went back to weaving about the virus. And then I did more of it this year. And I actually took it off the loom last week and um, uh, hung it out on. Oh, we've lost you. You're muted. Hung it out on a cyclone fence today. It's about five metres long and sort of change in it um, uh, to reflect the change in the virus. But I never imagined it would be an artwork that I would exhibit. I really was just doing this for myself. And um, I started, you know, I did a luggage tag each day of the number of cases internationally and the number of deaths. And, um, and then I started writing a word on or a phrase on the back. Um, and I finished it last week earlier than I, I wanted to do 40 days. So I could only do 27. Um, my own feeling about the weaving absolutely mirrored my feeling about the lockdown and the virus at this stage. And my last tag says, I am so, so sick of this. <laughs> um, and I meant both the lockdown and the weaving. Oh. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing the pictures when you had it out on the fence. Yes, I could I could try and upload one if you could bear with me. I did take one today. Oh, only you can do that tomorrow. Don't worry. I will put it up on my Instagram tonight. Yeah, and um, send one through and I'll put it up on the show's website right. too. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. I'm, I'm Mary Handweaver on Instagram. Yeah, and then there's... And oh. this one, this is, this is really the main kind of thing that I do. Um, so 
I work with people when someone's died in a family, usually, um, and they have family clothes or other family textiles that they are keeping, but no one wants to wear them. Um, they don't want to throw them away, you know, or they're in a cupboard somewhere. And um, this is actually a small piece. Um, and I'm actually also making um, a queen size bedspread in the same design. Um, and this includes um, <laughs> clothes of a husband who died very suddenly of a massive heart attack while walking mm. home from dinner with his wife. Mm. So, uh, and he was in his early 60s, so, you know, earlier than one would want to think someone should die. Um, so there's the family picnic rug, um, a beautiful Jaeger jacket that he had personally made for him in London, beautiful fabric. His grandfather's overcoat fabric, um, an overcoat of his wife's, um, and... My work sort of really focused on what, how fab clothing and, and other family textiles kind of hold memory and how do you keep that going if you want to when someone's died? Mm. When the clothes themselves are not something one would want to wear. Um, and um, when I work with people, what I end up making is very much a collaborative thing. Like this design, I've worked very closely um, with the person I'm making it for on the colour scheme. I've visited her house to sort of get a sense of what her aesthetic's like. Um, sometimes people just give me the clothes and fabrics and say, I trust you, just do something for me with them that I can mm. have. With other people, it's it's there's quite a process of talking about the meaning of each piece of clothing or fabric, um, and somehow there's a kind of transformation for the person around that. Like one woman I worked with, her father had um, not been he'd, he'd been quite cruel to her as a child, and I was doing work with a jumper of his that she had actually spun the wool for. And when the piece was finished, she said she it, we talked quite a lot about his war work and she felt at the end that she understood him and she forgave him. And I, I mean, I don't set out for people to have that kind of transformation, but um, quite often they do have hey. some sort Wait, shifting the way Penny. you think about the person who, who's died. Um, I think that's all I want to say. Oh, thank you very much. I do want to say how wonderful it is hearing everyone else's incredible creative sort of sources. And um, uh, sorry, there's just a very nice message on the screen from two people. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and I can't wait to meet people in person. Yeah, I, think, yeah. I don't care if no one else turns up to our exhibition. I want to meet everyone else. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, after Thank talking you. to you all and emailing and everything for so long. Anyway. Thank you. There we go. Nikki. We know you're there, Nikki. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Look, I put my piece up, it's precariously balanced on some boxes to try and get some height up, just to get a sense of the dimension, which I'm not sure if you can really, but um, this is one of six large pieces that I've begun working on. This one's dyed with onion skins, and I've taken threads out of the cloth after I've dyed it and re-stitched them back in. And they can be difficult to see. They're almost invisible um, in the cloth. Um, but I've also used reclaimed threads and um, have stitched with those. I've been working a lot on much smaller pieces. So this is my beginning of working on large pieces and it's one of six large pieces. 
which is um, a series. And um, they're about the internal landscape. It's about reflecting on life and the journeys in which my life has taken me and the subtleties and the hidden parts of it and the obvious parts um, or the more uh, yeah, obvious, I suppose, parts in it. There are bits in there that are squares that are stitched in, um, which are like settling places or times of reflection or needing to think again or come back to oneself. I don't plan the work that I do at all. It's picking up the cloth, picking up a thread and I begin and then it starts from there. And I love that meandering process of seeing where the stitches take me. Um, and I, it's part of a deeper reflective process and a, a process I find of repair from day to day life and um, the challenges of life. Um, it gives me a place to come back and find myself regroup and be centered again. Um, I'm self-taught and have really valued the, the teachers that I've had along the way who've um, supported me in my work. I also use damask. I love working with old damask tablecloths and that's primarily what I work with. Um, and the silk kind of quality that happens in your hands as you start stitching over a period of time, it becomes like silk or butter. And, you know, the ability to kind of imbue memory into cloth and reclaimed cloth using reclaimed or um, donated threads that have been given to me and creating new memories and experiences within that cloth. Um, it's very important. And I find a, a, a lovely internal process for myself. So yeah, each piece is a different color and they look different, but there is a theme of the large circle um, and threads moving through each piece. Um, so yeah, this okay. is number two of six. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Oh, hang on. What, it keeps, got a mind of its own, this thing. Uh, Nicole. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to meet you all, finally. It's so yeah. exciting. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I look forward to seeing everyone next year as well, hopefully. So um, I've got two different sorts of work in the show. Um, this is a set which I've written down. It's called Some Thoughts on Female Status. So um, I'm particularly concerned with the fact that all my life and many other people women have worked in textiles, for example. And just the fact that I work with textiles has meant that I earn less money and my chances of earning money, um, say for example, I can't go in the Archibald Prize or all the major art prizes, for example, do not include textiles. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm concerned about that. I'm just concerned about you know the rights of women, how they're being reduced all over the world at the moment. So this piece here is actually a collection of six and I'm working on more, like at the moment, I think I'm up to nine. And, but I thought for the show, I'd put them together um, almost like a quilt. And um, the top one says, for example, made by a woman. And then it says, this art form is undervalued. And um, the one below that is actually an image of Grace Tame. And wow. that says something like, if I, can remember uh you know grace tame human rights activists putting fear into the hearts of grown men and next to her is um muriel matters some of you will know her um a suffragette australian who traveled the world and we don't know about her because she is simply a woman and her history has been hidden from us and i've written revolutionary under her so all the pieces are made up of just bits of old calico that I scoop off the floor because during COVID, my daughter is a fashion student and, and the back room is covered with all her toile calico pieces, etc. Um, it's all just scrap material 
I'm lucky, my, my friends and my students, they know, they give me all their scraps. The top one has pyjamas in it. When I was lucky enough to get to go to Lee and Gaffer to visit a friend, she just cut up one of her old pyjamas and um, that's made up of that. I know. <laughs> and um, so there's lots of bits and pieces like that. This piece is very simple, very, like I like these to be simple, direct. I want the message. To, the message is important to me. So I make it direct. Sometimes you got to think and I make it a little bit difficult to read deliberately so that people are forced to really read it and then maybe that triggers in their mind well you know I need to think about this you know I need to think about what this statement is saying um, so I make it difficult so it slows them down when they're reading and all the braids and the laces and the ribbons etc are just given to me it's amazing what gets given to me and somehow I just find, you know, I mix it all up and join them all up with the different laces, et cetera. And they're important to me because a lot of you will know that, you know, ribbons, laces have had a huge, they were so important to women in history, throughout mm -hmm. history. And um, so that is why those braids and those laces are used. So everything there, nothing's bought, it's all recycled, um, it's all old. And um, yeah, I think that's really important in that particular work. And then there's this one, which is completely different. And um, the other ones are kind of really rough and raw, if you actually see them. This one is really quite refined. Um, it's only about 21 centimetres, you know, round, I'm not good with that diameter business. And um, it's pure hand stitchery. It's very intensely stitched. Um, I did work on a massive, uh, COVID quilt during last year but during lockdown I think during lockdown three or four four you know because who knows what we're up to um, I, I didn't like lockdown four or five I was very you know confused by the whole thing so this really has everything in it that I love and by that I mean it's very strange piece and even I find it's quite confusing confusing it was hard to do because I make it up as I go but I started off with the idea of heaven and hell and the plague and the medieval times and I love looking at that type of imagery um, I for some reason kept imagining a trip to Beijing and walking through all the beautiful or well, beautiful you know the fabulous little laneways and things and getting totally lost um, I myself ride bikes all over the place and up and down every laneway in Melbourne now, obviously, because we can't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so there's sort of the pathways and the undulation going on there. It's like what I feel when I'm moving around on a bike or if not, even if I'm walking with my neighbours, say, for example. And, um, yeah, but I'm pretty sure definite on the eyes. I'm obsessed by the eyes that I see by the graffiti artists. I, I do love graffiti art. And um, there are a lot of eyes and they watch us as we walk down the back laneways or ride our bikes down the back laneways. And I find it really interesting to see the different eyes as I move around. So that's probably explains the eyes. But the general confusion was just simply my state of mind. I could keep my head down, I could stitch and just try, you know, and get through those couple of lockdowns. And so that explains that piece there. Thank you. That's great. No problem. Um, Pat. Well, I wasn't going to talk. You don't anymore. have to, if you don't want to. It's okay. Everyone's been so generous and I'm enjoying this so much. So um, basically, uh, this isn't really like my normal work, but um, during lockdown, like everybody else, um, okay. I started feeling, like I wanted to do something different and these are what my father used to call follow your nose so he'd say you know if you're going for a walk he'd say just follow your nose you don't need to know where you're going just just keep walking and you'll find something exciting and I that's how I did the two pieces that are here I, I wanted to do something abstract where my brain didn't work where I didn't worry I'll just put the dog out um afterwards and um yes these abstract pieces came out of that just using what i had in the cupboard and, and following what the work told me it wanted rather than what i had planned 
Oh, oh lovely. Yeah. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm enjoying this. Oh, great. Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you for um, having me here. Um, I don't feel like I quite belong in some ways in that oh, pre-lockdown. I know, but <laughs> I don't. I don't sort of. I don't quite see myself as a textile artist yet because I. I guess I kind of grew up as an engineer, so um, lockdown kind of brought an end to my day job. So I have crocheted all my life, and I did do a lot of um, crochet during lockdown. And then I had the opportunity to teach it as a volunteer at Sister Work, so I kind of had the excuse to do it all day. So I guess just crocheting all day and making shapes, making amigurumi designs for beginners to to learn really kind of got me involved in crochet and then I, I just used up all my um, scrap wool I had at home um, making shapes and I, I, I think the thing that really turned my life around was getting a book by a mathematician called Dana Tamina who used crochet to, um, to depict hyperbolic shapes in maths um, because the professors she had didn't know how to kind of portray them whereas crochet if anyone's done it you know as soon as you get those ruffles that's basically a hyperbolic shape so the, the mathematicians couldn't kind of create that same shape in in 3d using a piece of paper so i started making shapes and i ran out of of my yarn stash so i started stripping copper wires and using those and what i kind of discovered was that the the pattern of crochet stitches was very like the pattern of stitches um <laughs> It, yeah, um, the, those twins that did, so this is a note that just popped up, um, yeah. a lot of coral reefs are done in crochet, similar sort of shapes. So um, that whole kind of like putting two stitches into one and keep going ends up um, also showing exponential growth. So I don't know whether you ever listened to those press conferences and they kept talking about the reproductive rate of the virus and, and people were obsessed with the case numbers and Mm -hmm. And I kept saying that doesn't the number doesn't matter. It's the pattern of the number. If it's doubling every day, it's a problem. If it's staying the same, it's not a problem. So that R number was basically was sort of the reproductive. So whenever I heard another R number, I would just recreate it in crochet stitches. Um, and, I, and, you know, I found that they made quite kind of interesting shapes. So um, I kept going and it's kept me sane and and it's kept me creating and kept me busy. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Uh, Rosa. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the country of the Bunurong Nation in which I swim, create and, um, and live on. Um, yeah, these two works um, are quite similar in their process. Um, they're very small to start off with. They're probably about an A4 size. And um, it's a real mix of collage, drawing, um, and, and really two, two um, iconic um, subject matters, the magpie and the hill's hoist. And my work is sort of is a bit of a seesaw in that I, I oscillate between public art projects that are very uh, usually steel and um, strong stru structural outcomes and then I find that my my own practice is very fragile soft um, anything that I can carry around in my in my bag so the magpie um, and the hills hoist um, are two things that I am obsessed about um, the mag I have three magpies that I especially during lockdown they've just become my my besties down here I live on the Mornington Peninsula and um, so really it's a, it's a mix of collage, photography, crayon, drawing on an A4 size um, sort of uh, space, if you like. And then I began to sew. And it was something that um, I um, watched my mother um, to all my life. She's a fifth generation seamstress and I can't sew for the life of me. So I found myself pulling out the, um, the sewing machine and really just colouring in, in a way, over um, the original, uh, I ended up 
printing onto canvas so that it could cope with the with the repetitive nature of the sewing machine and just kept sewing over the different spaces, whether it was the hills hoist or, or the doorway, which is another um, preoccupation of mine. And the magpie, um, then I felt that based on its sort of movement, requ it, it required, um, well, they both actually have a lot of movement in them, but I wanted to reprint it on to silk um, and then I kept sewing on top of the silk. Um, so I became quite fascinated with the types of threads, um, their durability, um, their, their shininess, and, um, and, re and, and began to learn about what, where the thread has come from. Um, and I guess in a way, I wonder how long my work, how long the work will, will cope um, in terms of my love of light. So it's really about hanging it in a, in a light, in a space where the light can be seen through the work. So I'm still exploring, um, and I think I've nailed it now, where the work is uh, printed on a type of silk where the, the light is still can flow through mm -hmm. it and it can cope with the, with the sunlight. Beautiful. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rosalie. No, Rosalie, no. Okay, Sally. Oh, you're here a minute ago. Okay. Yeah, I thought she was here. Um, maybe, well, not everyone wants to talk. So yes, maybe... I am. Sorry, I'm oh. just unmuting. Um, oh, sorry, there you go. Oops, sorry about that. Go back again. Hang on. There we go. Uh, so, my work is about place. I've been working um, with maps for uh, in my work for about 25, oh, 20 so years. Um, I've done printmaking um, and uh, textiles in my um, studies. But this work, Eating on High, is from a series that I'm developing on the local high street. I live in Northcote and um, I'm sort of revisiting or reimagining, I suppose, the places. I use photos that I've taken and then I use stitch to draw and um, layer with papers and um, various other fabrics and I always include maps in my work and the second piece um, the Banksia one that's layered uh, that's paper and fabric and stitch on um, map of the area where that plant is found I did a big series of these called mapped plants last year when I my brain was a bit fried so I wanted to do something that I could just keep going on. So I have a lot of maps from um, various sources, a lot of old maps uh, that I've collected as well. And um, so I collage, I'm a collage artist essentially that you, I use stitch to draw and stitch things together. And um, yeah, so these are papers and silk, I hand dye the silk and then um, either hand stitch or machine stitch the work together. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Sam. Hello. Um, I'm a printmaker based in central Victoria. I've been working um, in reduction lino cuts for quite a few years. And I've also been sewing for as long as I can remember. I was taught by my mum. Mm -hmm. um, and just things for the home and just playing around, really. And then a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted to mix the two. So I've been printing with lino onto um, cotton and linen and then making it into patchwork pieces for a while. Um, so I print onto fabric. I'm not sure if you can see these little bits here um, and then cut them up uh, and end up with, with stacks and stacks of them, which I sew back together again. And the idea of the pieces uh, is um, it's based on iteration or imperceptible change. Um, so um, it's kind of about the, um, the sense of change in life, really, that when you're very close to it, either physically close or through time, you can't see change happening. So it's hard to see the, the change of seasons or, or aging or, you know, maybe sort of personal growth. And it's only when you, um, you look back at something, you can see how far you've come. So um, Panorama, which was the, um, 
the other piece with the hexagons, um, that's based on a landscape with the idea that you're at the center and you're looking out at the, at the landscape um, and you're seeing the, the landscape unfold in front of you. And in my um, lino cut work, I try to use atmospheric perspective quite a bit. So the way that the landscape changes in its tones um, as with, with distance, very sort of imperceptibly. So you can't really tell at what point it changes. It just very gradually changes. Um, and, um, and these were quite personal because I've been exploring lots of ideas of paths and, um, and landscapes kind of unfolding um in front of me and i'm making these as part of a series so i'm making these bigger and bigger every time i do one they're getting a bit more ambitious every time um and i love the the process part of it um that you know sewing each together and it feels like i'm never going to get them done um you know until i look back and i have got got quite a bit done um so um the other one the um inside iteration um it's made in a similar way. Um, that one is um, machine sewn. Um, and it's um, based again on that idea of um, coming out of a darkness very gradually. Um, it's cho I've chosen quite strong structures for each. So arches, circles, hexagons are quite strong as a uh, juxtaposition against the, the delicate stitches and the um, delicateness of the fabric. Um, and, you know, in this case, I wanted to show that, give an idea of coming out of darkness very gradually um, and not necessarily, you know, being drawn back into the darkness, but then coming out of it a little more um, and ending up with something quite light. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, you can get that. Samantha? No? Okay, uh, Sandra. Now I'm lucky I've got this piece in my house at the moment because she sent it down for the exhibition, but of course then we had to postpone and it's beautiful. Um, don't, don't, Sandra's not here, okay. Um, oh, me, okay. So um, my two entries in this, uh, this is my first one, which is Shattered. And this is around, again, the fires, which we were talking about earlier. Um, so the top one, top left-hand vase was um, just a vase I liked and I broke it. And then I was looking, so this was right at the beginning um, of our lockdowns, looking at ways of putting it back. And um, I was looking at Kintsugi and decided that um, there were bits missing and it wasn't really going to work to do the Japanese style of gluing it back with the gold glue. Um, and then I had done a workshop some time ago where I'd done this eco dyeing on these are old silk shirts. And so I started covering the pieces and stitching them back together. And when I did the first phase, it just reminded me of the fires by using the black stitch and the fact that they're all um, different eucalyptus dyed pieces. Um, and so it kind of, they keep coming. So at the moment, there's four in this series on Shattered. Um, and then this was when I then moved on to the Kintsugi. So this top piece, the lidded bowl, um, was a Chinese bowl my sister had. And she used to put it out for the birds. And one of the birds dropped it off the veranda. And that happened just after she died. So her partner gave it to me um, and I put it back together. Uh, the lid wasn't on it, so it didn't break. So that was that. And then it's just pieces. So these all are using gold thread to put them back, which is much more that Japanese kintsugi idea. And it's about, you know, honoring our past by creating future pieces. So, um, yeah, and it's lots of fun. <laughs> and, and, and I use the holes to represent the fact that we're not all whole. So, yeah. So that is me. And then Virginia. I saw Virginia. Hi. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm so glad I, I lost my connection there for a moment, but just got it back. Um, Tamara, thank you so much. And also to Anna. And um, yeah, it's amazing hearing everybody's, about everybody's work. It's uh, extremely rich. And I'm really, really glad to be part of this, even though I'm a long way away. 
Uh, but these works were done in 2019, 2020 in Balmoral, which is in the uh, near, near the Grampians, um, at uh, in an old post office um, uh, with Chameleon Arts Collective. There, uh, the people within the collective gave me um, what I call memory objects. Um, which could be, apart from all the yarns, uh, photographs, uh, little talismanic objects, whatever it is, yeah, um, pages out of books, diaries, um, whatever they felt that they'd like to be woven into a kind of collective constellation uh, during the time that I was there. These, so I did three or four there in Balmoral over the summers of 2019 and 2020 when um, I was very obviously like all of you, very aware of the bushfires and I also mm -hmm. got stuck in Australia for a while. So um, because of the beginning of COVID, so they were also affected very much by that. This is part of a series that I've been doing. I started in Africa and then um, I've been doing in Italy. I'm sorry about the quality of the photos, but I didn't have time to do them before I left. But um, I guess I'm trying to combine the idea of uh, cosmic time, which I think also I've seen a lot of today, the circular time, the time with that beginning and end, which is very connected to handwork and weaving with, um, with chronological time, with the god Kronos, when people see this work, and I also feel like this with a lot of the work that I've seen today, which is handmade, uh, there's a very strong body reaction within the viewer of, oh my goodness, how long did it take you to do that? And so I love putting together these two ways mm -hmm. of experiencing time um, I'm not a textile artist, but I do tend to be using more and more thread. And I think that's part of it because of making that ancient body connection through the hand to the heart and the head. I think it's all deeply connected. Um, so these works, for example, this was a picture of an Irish guy uh, doing the jig from uh, a book that somebody gave me. And I think the original uh, uh, image was um, something like 1850 in Victoria but because of the time we live in it became a different image um, I have Irish origin as well but it became an image of my ancestors dancing across a land that was not theirs and it, it took on a whole kind of sinister meaning as well um, kind of death dance, I guess, when I'm, I'm in looking at it now. Uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity in these works. They're dupla fast, so they're actually on the back, there's also um, handwork. And I better stop talking because I feel like I'm talking too much. No. <laughs> okay, just a sec. Beautiful. So yeah, so they're about place. These are about Balmoral in Australia. It's about the people I met, met there were very generous with me it's about intuition because I didn't know what people were going to give me and uh you know this is kind of like there's infinite variations on any narrative that we can make so this was the random not random variation that happened uh collaboration um I think that's probably it but uh, they're 80 centimeters diameter. And um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be part of this. And it's very moving to me to be part of an opening, even though I'm in Italy. Yeah. <laughs> well, we can't move anywhere, so we're all small. <laughs> yeah, so I can roll into, I mean, you know, solidarity with all of you that you've been in lockdown. My son's in Melbourne too. <clears throat> you've been in lockdown forever. A long really. time. Yeah, we, we made it, we're the top city. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so I'd like to remind everyone while it's online now, I might stop sharing this and I can show you if I share. I set it up so hopefully it'll work. Um, okay, so the it's now on the website. This, it's, we're live. Um, we're supported this month by Craft Contemporary. 
the artists now, if you want to see a particular artist, so if we wanted to go down to Virginia as the last one to speak, you can just click on her name, see her work, and then go back to the top to click on whoever else you want. So I've tried to make it as easy as possible to look at everyone's work. Um, and hopefully you will love it. So Thank you um, so much. Thank you. And I'm hoping I'll get to actually meet you all in person when we actually get to 45 downstairs in February. So the 8th to the 19th of February. And we'll be having an opening on the 8th um, from 5 till 7 p.m. in person. And we by then we'll all be double vaccinated and life will be good. So, um, <laughs> would anyone like to ask any of the artists any questions or mention anything or whatever? I, I just think you've done a beautiful job. Yeah, I'm really, yeah, I'm very sad I didn't get my work in on time. Oh, just, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing the exhibition in February. Well, hopefully we'll be able to do it again next year. Um, you know, and if anyone knows anyone who would like to sponsor us, yes. I tried to get sponsorship, but I just didn't know enough people. So, you know, if anyone knows anyone who would sponsor us next year, that would be even better. <laughs> Thanks, right, Tim. Tara. Thank you, Tamara. Yeah. Thank, Thank you all you for much. coming Tamara. along. It's been lovely yeah. to hear all about your work from you in person. Thank yes. you very much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.